forward. After the Second Vatican Council, a number of new catechisms appeared which did not present Catholic doctrine as it should be presented, and these new publications even included some very grave errors. Coupled with the new methods, whereby children are not required to memorize, two generations of children have grown up not knowing the Catholic faith. For many years, Rome did nothing. Now there has been published the new Catechism of the Catholic Church. It has been written for bishops who are required to adapt it to the needs of the faithful. One may fear that some bishops will put off this task for a very long time. Others will water down the doctrine even further. Yet others will give only a partial presentation of the doctrine, leaving important points untold. Thus the need is still great for a catechism to be put in the hands of the student in which he may find clear and complete answers to his questions. What better could be given him than the catechism of, of St. Pius X, the holy pope of the modern era? To my knowledge, the catechism of St. Pius X has never been published in English in its original text. There is one catechism of Christian doctrine published by the Reverend Monsignor Eugene Cavane in Virginia, USA in 1974, but in fact it contains a much later text, which lacks much of the original text. It is the translation of the Catechismo della Dottrina Cristiana, the standard Italian catechism, as it was in 1953. That Italian catechism is, in turn, a summary and reduction of the original catechism of St. Pius X. The American edition in 1974 has further been adapted according to the Second Vatican Council, thus losing much of the value of the original text. E.g. expressions like, soldiers of Christ are suppressed from the teaching on the effects of confirmation. The only book where I was able to find the authentic text is the excellent Compendium of Catechetical Instructions by the Right Reverend Monsignor John Hagen, first published in Dublin in 1910 and containing for each chapter of the Catechism the relevant part from the Catechism of the Council of Trent, the question and answers for the Catechism of St. Pius X, and Father Rainieri's Catechetical Instructions, which were very popular in the 19th century. We present here Monsignor Hagen's text, with very slight modifications of style only. The current discipline of the Church on matters such as fasting has been included in smaller print to bring the text up to date without altering the original answers. May this edition of St. Pius X's Catechism help priests, teachers, and parents to impart the knowledge and love of the doctrine of the Catholic Church to their pupils and their children in all its entirety and beauty. It is our hope that it will also help adult Catholics to revise and deepen their own knowledge of the faith. It will be very helpful to catechumens to assist them towards a complete knowledge of the one true faith. May the clear knowledge of the eternal truths of our faith build in all readers the great certitudes that are the foundations of solid virtues. May the Immaculate Heart of the Blessed Virgin Mary obtain all these graces for the readers of this volume, and may they pray for me. Abridged from the introduction of Father Francois Lesney, 1993, Sydney, Australia. Introduction to a Compendium of Catechetical Instruction by the Right Reverend Monsignor John Hagen. The Catechism as we now know it is of comparatively recent origin. Previous to the invention of printing and the consequent possibility of the spread of books and the education among the masses of the people, the widespread use of a catechism was plainly out of the question. Its place was supplied by brief formula, not infrequently set to rhyme, which were committed to memory and handed down from generation to generation, conveying a brief statement of the truths more necessary to salvation. The, ne the nearest approaches to the modern catechism would be St. Cyril's Catechesis, St. Augustine's Instruction of the Ignorant, and, later on, certain works of Al Alcuin, Robinus Maurus, and Gerson. The publication and widespread diffusion of an infinity of catechisms, compiled by Luther and his followers for the purpose of disseminating their new doctrines, stimulated the energies of Catholic writers in similar direction. And accordingly, several Catholic catechisms were issued within the next few years, giving a clear and simple statement of Catholic doctrine, particularly on those points that were being attacked by the Reformers. Of these, several of which were prescribed for diocesan use, the principal were those of Erasmus, Witzel, Dietenberg, Fabri, Titelmann, Hosius, and Blessed Peter Canisius in Germany, of Parvi, de Bourbon, du Bellay, du Thau in France, of Sonius, Hessel, 
Cuneus in the Low Countries, of Dominic Soto, John of St. Thomas, and Flores in Spain, of Bartholomew of the Martyrs, and Louis of Granada in Portugal, and of Cardinal Contarini, Marini, and Crispoldi in Italy. But as we already pointed out, the fathers of the Council of Trent showed at a very early date that they were satisfied with none of the existing works, and then that they were fully alive to the need of necessity of preparing an authentic, authoritative catechism. The realization of their desire, however, was retarded for several years by events over which they had little control, and when the work was finally taken in hand, another idea prevailed resulting in the publication of a manual for the use of the clergy, and not, as originally suggested, a catechism for children and uninstructed adults. Of the countless catechisms that continued to appear, two, those of Bellarmine and Canisius, have steadily held their ground ever since, and to a large extent have served as the model of nearly all subsequent compilations of the kind. The influence of Canisius, however, has on the whole been limited to Germany, Whereas Bellarmine's Catechism, which was written by command of Pope Clement VIII in 1597, has been copied in almost every other country in the world, at an early date it had translated into Arabic, Latin, Modern Greek, French, Spanish, German, English, and Polish. It had the warm appropriation of Clement VIII, who presented it for use in the Papal States, of Urban VIII, who directed it to be adopted in all the Eastern missions, of Innocent XIII and Benedict XIV, particularly of the very important Council of All Italy, held at Rome in 1725, which made it obligatory in all the dioceses of the peninsula, and finally of the Vatican Council, which indicated it as the model for a proposed universal catechism. Though Bellarmine's catechism was largely followed as a model all over the world, yet owing to the modifications introduced in diocesan editions, it came to pass in the course of time that almost every diocese had its own catechism, differing in many respects from the catechisms of other dioceses. The obvious inconveniences of this bewildering multiplicity of catechisms occupied the attentions of the fathers of the First Vatican Council, the great majority of whom were agreed to as to the desirability of having a uniform small catechism for the faithful all over the world. Early during the sittings of the Council, 41 of the assembled fathers devoted six sessions, February 10th to February 22nd, to an examination of the question and the report which they drew up occupied the intention of the whole council during the sittings of April 29th and 30th. The question being put to a vote on May 4th, an immense majority was found to be in favor of the compilation of a small uniform catechism, to be compiled in Latin, translated into every language, and made obligatory in every diocese. But the approach of the Italian troops towards the walls of Rome brought the council to an untimely end, and there was no time to promulgate the constitution on the proposed uniform catechism, so that it has not the force of law. The idea, however, has never been lost of. During the, si the, si the sitting of the first catechetical congress in 1880, the then Bishop of Mantua, later St. Pius X, proposed that the Holy Father be petitioned to arrange for the compilation of a simple, plain, brief, and popular catechism for uniform use all over the world. Shortly after his elevation to the chair of St. Uh, Peter, Pius X at once set about realizing, within certain limits, his own proposal of 1880 by prescribing a uniform catechism, the Compendium of Christian Doctrine, for use in the dioceses of the ecclesiastical province of Rome, at the same time indicating that it was his earnest desire to have the same manual adopted all over Italy. The text selected was, with slight modifications, that which had been adopted for some years by the united hierarchy of Piedmont, Liguria, Lombardy, Emilia, and Tuscany. It contained three catechisms. The first, which is intended for infant schools and for the home, and which covers about 13 pages, sets forth briefly the more elementary truths of faith, chiefly by way of formula to be committed to memory. The second part, called the short catechism, is intended chiefly for primary schools and for children preparing for the sacraments. It contains about 60 pages devoted to a brief exposition of the doctrine of the creed, sacraments, commandments, and prayer. The larger catechism, which forms the third part, explains these at greater length, in about 200 pages. It is succeeded by an explanation of the principal feasts of the year, covering 60 pages, followed by 40 pages of a brief history of religion, and includes and concludes with a certain number of daily prayers and prayers for special occasions. J. H. Col Irish College, Rome, Feast of St. Charles Borromeo, 1911, Monsignor John Hagen. Preliminary Lesson on Christian Doctrine and its Principal Parts. 
Question 1. Are you a Christian? Answer. Yes, I am a Christian by the grace of God. Question 2. Why do you say by the grace of God? Answer. I say by the grace of God because to be a Christian is a perfectly gratuitous gift of God, which we ourselves could not have merited. Question 3. Who is a true Christian? Answer. A true Christian is he who is baptized, who believes and professes the Christian doctrine, and obeys the lawful pastors of the church. Question 4. What is Christian doctrine? Answer. The cr Christian doctrine is the doctrine which Jesus Christ our Lord taught us to show us the way of salvation. Question 5. Is it necessary to learn the doctrine taught by Jesus Christ? Answer. It certainly is necessary to learn the doctrine taught by Jesus Christ, and those who fail to do so are guilty of a grave breach of duty. Question 6. Are parents and guardians bound to send their children and those dependent on them to catechism? Answer. Parents and guardians are bound to see that their children and dependents learn Christian doctrine, and they are guilty before God if they neglect this duty. Question 7. From whom are we to receive and learn Christian doctrine? Answer. We are to receive and learn Christian doctrine from the Holy Catholic Church. Question 8. How are we certain that Christian doctrine which we receive from the Holy Catholic Church is really true? Answer. We are certain that the doctrine which we receive from the Holy Catholic Church is true because Jesus Christ, the divine author of this doctrine, committed it through his apostles to the Church, which he founded and made the infallible teacher of all men promising her his divine assistance until the end of time. Question 9. Are there other proofs of the truth of Christian doctrine? Answer. The truth of Christian doctrine is also shown by the eminent sanct sanctity of numbers who have professed it and who still profess it, by the heroic fortitude of the martyrs, by its marvelous and rapid propagation in the world, and by its perfect preservation throughout so many centuries of ceaseless and varied struggles. Question 10. What and how many are the principal and most necessary parts of Christian doctrine? Answer. The principal and most necessary parts of Christian doctrine are four. The Creed, the Our Father, the Commandments, and the Sacraments. Question 11. What does the Creed teach us? Answer. The Creed teaches us the principal articles of our holy faith. Question 12. What does the Our Father teach us? Answer. The Our Father teaches us all that we are to hope from God, and all we are to ask of Him. Question 13. What do the commandments teach us? Answer. The commandments teach us all that we are to do to please God, all of which is summed up in loving God above all things and our neighbor as ourselves for the love of God. Question 14. What does the doctrine of the sacraments teach us? Answer. The doctrine of the sacraments shows us the nature and right use of those means which Jesus Christ has instituted to remit our sins, give us his grace, infuse into and increase in us the virtues of faith, hope, and charity. The Apostles' Creed, the Creed in general. Question 1. What is the part, first part of Christian doctrine? Answer. The first part of Christian doctrine is the symbol of the Apostles, commonly called the Creed. Question 2. Why do you call the Creed the symbol of the Apostles? Answer. The Creed is called the symbol of the Apostles because it is a summary of the truths of faith taught by the Apostles. Question 3. How many articles are there in the Creed? Answer. There are 12 articles in the Creed. Question 4. Recite them. Answer. 1. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. 2. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. 3. Who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary. 4. Suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. 5. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. 6. He ascended into heaven, sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 7. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. 8. I believe in the Holy Ghost. 9. The Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. 10. The forgiveness of sins. 11. The resurrection of the body. 12. Life everlasting. Amen. 5. 
What is the meant by the word I believe, which you say at the beginning of the symbol? Answer. The word I believe means I hold everything which is contained in these 12 articles to be perfectly true, and I believe these truths more firmly than if I saw them with my eyes, because God, who can neither deceive nor be deceived, has revealed them into the Holy Catholic Church and through this church to us. Question 6. What do the articles of the Creed contain? Answer. The articles of the Creed contain the principal truths to be believed concerning God, Jesus Christ, and the Church, his spouse. Question 7. Is it useful to recite the, free, the Creed frequently? Answer. It is most useful to recite the Creed frequently, so as to impress the truths of faith more and more deeply on our hearts. The first article of the Creed, God the Father Almighty. Question 1. What does the first article of the Creed, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, teach us? Answer. The first article of the Creed teaches us that there is one God, and only one, that he is omnipotent and has created heaven and earth and all things contained in them, that is to say, the whole universe. Question 2. How do we know that there is a God? Answer. We know that there is a God because reason proves it and faith confirms it. Question 3. Why do we call God the Father? Answer. We call God the Father because by nature he is the Father of the second person of the Blessed Trinity. That is to say, of the Son begotten of him. Because God is the Father of all men, whom he has created and whom he preserves and governs. Finally, because by grace he is the Father of all good Christians, who are hence called the adopted sons of God. Question 4. Why is the Father the first person of the Blessed Trinity? Answer. The Father is the first person of the Blessed Trinity because he does not proceed from any other person, but is the principle of the other two persons, that is, of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Question 5. What is meant by the word omnipotent? Answer. The word omnipotent means that God can do all that he wills. Question 6. God can neither sin nor die. How then do we say he can do all things? Answer. Though he can neither sin nor die, we say God can do all things, because to be able to sin or die is not an effect of power, but of weakness, which cannot exist in God, who is most perfect. On creation. Question 7. What is meant by the words, creator of heaven and earth? To create means to make out of nothing. Hence, God is called the creator of heaven and of earth, because he made heaven and earth and all things contained therein, that is, the whole universe, out of nothing. Question 8. Who was the world created by the Father alone? Answer. The world was created by all the three divine persons, because whatever one person does with regard to creatures is done by the other two persons in one and the self-same act. Question 9. Why then is creation specially attributed to the Father? Answer. Creation is especially attributed to the Father because creation is a work of divine omnipotence which is specially attributed to the Father, just as wisdom is attributed to the Son and goodness to the Holy Ghost, though all three persons possess the same omnipotence, wisdom, and goodness. Question 10. Does God take any interest in the world and in the things created by him? Answer. Yes, God takes an interest in the world and in all things created by him. He preserves them and governs them by his infinite goodness and wisdom, and nothing happens here below that he does not either will or permit. Question 11. Why do you say that nothing happens here below that he does not either will or permit? Answer. We say that nothing happens here below that he does not either will or permit because there are some things which God wills and commands, while there are others which he simply does not prevent, such as sin. Question 12. Why does not God prevent sin? Answer. God does not prevent sin because even from the very abuse man makes of the liberty with which he is endowed, God knows how to bring forth good and to make his mercy or his justice become more and more resplendent. The Angels Question 13. Which are the noblest of God's creatures? Answer. The noblest creatures created by God are the angels. Question 14. Who are the angels? Answer. The angels are the intelligent and purely spiritual creatures. Question uh, 15. Why did God create the angels? God created the angels so as to be honored and served by them, and to give them eternal happiness. Question 16. What form and figure have the angels? Answer. The angels have neither form nor material figure of any kind, 
because they are pure spirits created by God in such a way to exist without having to be united to a body. Question 17. Why then are the angels represented under sensible forms? Answer. The angels are represented under sensible forms, one, as a help to our imagination, and two, because they have thus appeared many times to men, as we read in sacred scripture. Question 18. Were all the angels faithful to God? Answer. No. The angels were not all faithful to God. Many of them through pride claimed to be his equal and independent of him, for which sin they were banished forever from paradise and condemned to hell. Question 19. What are the angels called who were banished forever from paradise and condemned to hell? Answer. The angels banished forever from paradise and condemned to hell are called demons, and their chief is called Lucifer, or Satan. 20. Can the demons do us any harm? The answer, yes, the demons can do us great harm both in soul and body, especially by tempting us to sin, provided God permits them to do so. Question 21. Why do they tempt us? Answer, the demons tempt us because they en the envy they bear us, which makes them desire our eternal damnation, and because of their hatred of God, whose image is reflected in us. God, on the other hand, permits those temptations in order that we may overcome them by his grace, and thus practice virtue and acquire merit for heaven. Question 22. How are temptations conquered? Temptations are conquered by watchfulness, prayer, and Christian mortification. Question 23. What are the angels called who remained faithful to God? Answer. The angels who remained faithful to God are called the good angels, heavenly spirits, or simply angels. Question 24. What became of the angels who remained faithful to God? The angels who remained faithful to God were confirmed in grace for Forever enjoy the vision of God, love him, bless him, and praise him eternally. Question 25. Does God use the angels as his ministers? Answer. Yes. God uses the angels as his ministers, especially does he entrust to many of them the office of acting as our guardians and protectors. Question 26. Should we have a particular devotion to our guardian angel? Answer. Yes, we should have a particular devotion to our guardian angel. We should honor him invoke his aid, and follow his inspirations, and be grateful to him for the continual assistance he affords us. Man. Question 27. Which is the noblest creature God has placed on earth? Answer. The noblest creature God has placed on earth is man. Question 28. What is man? Answer. Man is a rational creature composed of soul and body. Question 29. What is the soul? The soul is the noblest part of man because it is a spiritual substance, endowed with intelligence and will, capable of knowing God and of possessing him for all eternity. Question 30. Can the human soul be seen and touched? Answer. Our soul can neither be seen nor touched because it is a spirit. Question 30. 1. Does the human soul die with the body? Answer. The human soul never dies. Faith and our very reason prove that it is immortal. Question 32. Is man free in his actions? Answer. Yes, man is free in his actions, and each one feels within himself that he can do a thing or leave it undone or do one thing rather than another. Question 33. Explain human liberty by an example. Answer. If I voluntarily tell a lie, I know that I could have left it unsaid, or that I could have remained silent, and that, on the other hand, I could also speak differently and tell the truth. Question 34. Why do we say that man was created to the image and likeness of God? Answer. We say that man was created to the image and likeness of God because the human soul is spiritual and rational, free in its operations, capable of knowing and loving God and of enjoying Him forever. Perfections which reflect a ray of the infinite greatness of the Lord in us. Question 35. In what state did God place our first parents, Adam and Eve? Answer. God placed our first parents, Adam and Eve, in the state of innocence and grace, but they soon fell away by sin. Question 36. Besides innocence and sanctifying grace, did God confer any other gifts on our first parents? Answer. Besides innocence and sanctifying grace, God conferred on our first parents other gifts, which along with sanctifying grace, they were to transmit to their descendants. These were, one, integrity, that is, the perfect subjection of sense, reason, two, immortality, 
Three, immunity from all pain and sorrow. Four, a knowledge in keeping with their state. Question 37, what is the nature of Adam's sin? Answer, Adam's sin was a sin of pride and of grave disobedience. Answer 38, what chastisement was meted out to the sin of Adam and Eve? Answer, Adam and Eve lost the grace of God and the right they had to heaven. They were driven out of the earthly paradise, subjected to many miseries of soul and body, and condemned to death. Question 39. If Adam and Eve had not sinned, would they have been exempt from death? Answer. If Adam and Eve had not sinned, and if they had remained faithful to God, they would, after a happy and tranquil sojourn here on earth, and without dying, have been transferred by God into heaven to enjoy a life of unending glory. Question 40. Were these gifts due to man? Answer. These gifts were in no way due to man, but were absolutely gratuitous and supernatural. And hence, when Adam disobeyed the divine command, God could, could without any injustice, deprive at both Adam and his posterity of them. Question 41. Is this sin proper to Adam alone? This sin is not Adam's sin alone, but is also our sin, though in a different sense. It is Adam's sin because he committed it by an act of his will, and hence in him it was a personal sin. It is our sin also because Adam, having committed it in his capacity as the head and source of the human race, it was transmitted by natural generations to all his descendants, and hence in us it is original sin. Question 42. How is it possible for original sin to be transmitted to all men? Answer. Original sin is transmitted to all men because God, having conferred sanctifying grace and other supernatural gifts on the human race in Adam, on the condition that Adam should not disobey him, and Adam having been disobeyed as head and father of the human race, rendered human nature rebellious against God. And hence, human nature is transmitted to all descendants of Adam in a state of rebellion against God, and deprived of divine grace and other gifts. Question 43. Do all men contract original sin? Answer. Yes, all men contract original sin with the exception of the Blessed Virgin, who was preserved from it by a singular privilege of God, in view of the merits of Jesus Christ our Savior. Question 44. Could not men be saved after Adam's sin? Answer. After Adam's sin, men could not be saved if God had not shown mercy towards them. Question 45. What was the mercy shown by God to the human race? Answer. The mercy shown by God to the human race was that of immediately promising Adam a divine redeemer or Messiah, and sending this Messiah in his own good time to free men from the slavery of sin and of the devil. Question 46. Who is the promised Messiah? Answer. The promised Messiah is Jesus Christ, as the second article of the Creed teaches. If you like videos like this, like and share this video and subscribe, and click the notification bell below. You can support my work on Patreon and Subscribestar. Links are found in the description below, along with links to my Twitter, the Sources blog, and the Return to Tradition Facebook page. Thanks for listening. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.